For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our, our study today on death, descendants, and decisions. Uh, this gives me a great opportunity to talk about these things today. As a believer, priest, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit in the church age, it's your privilege and responsibility to be sure that you're not carnal when you study the Bible, nor when you apply that Bible to your life. Because it's a spiritual book written to spiritual people functioning by the, the Holy Spirit of God, spirituality. And evidence of carnality would be personal sin. It could be mental attitude, sin, sense of the tongue, or overt sins. And the responsibility of the believer priest of, of 1 Peter 2 is to confess his sin. That's a privilege you have. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us, and that allows us to resume uh, uh, the principle of spiritual, of, uh, of uh, sanctification, not salvation, but sanctification and spirituality. You study the Bible as a spiritual person. The Holy Spirit teaches and recalls the scriptures to our souls. So I give you a moment for that. Those are with us in our study, as well as those who have traveled by the internet. Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come to study with us tonight uh, out of the book of Genesis and what we call the Toledoth series. And we're in the 11th Toledoth of the book of Genesis. And we're slowly grinding this out to the end on doctrines. And tonight we want to look at the subject of death, descendants, and decisions uh, regarding the loss of a, of a person within our family and the funeral and all that's entailed within it. And we see it here uh, in the 49th and 50th chapters of Genesis. Encourage our hearts tonight, Father, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit towards the truth and how it can be applied to our life in the 21st century. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, when you look at the better, bigger context of our study, you're looking at the chapter 49, verse 25, when, uh, um, jo when Jacob says, I'm about to die, I need to, I, need to, I need to tell you some things. And he goes through chapter 49 um, in uh, his will to his sons, and he gives a prophetic uh, outline as the last patriarch. He gives an outline to each of his 12 sons, a prophetic history to them. Then in uh, verse 29, he picks up the subject of his death. We, 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 we did a study uh, on premonitions and, and what, what, ha what should you do as a believer when you know ahead of time that you're going to die. And you... As a spiritual, mature believer, you will probably know. Um, so what should you do in that period once you're, you're made aware of it? The, the, some people die of natural causes and unexpectedly, and other people die just in a normal co course of time. It's all about timing in the plan of God. And when you do that, then we learn from King Ho uh, Hezekiah that it's time to set your household in order and we went into a lengthy discussion on what that should mean and and this is Jacob now and he's doing this and so when you look at verse 29 when he picks his subject up in verse 29 uh, after bringing charges uh, to all of his children and everything and it goes through the 50th chapter verse 14 you can see he's now into Prearranging his funeral. That's, that's chapter 49, 29 through 33. And you see Jacob's will. 
He's going to talk about death, descendants, and decisions. In the 50th chapter, uh, Joseph is made executor of his will, and, and he's embalmed. It takes 40 days uh, for this. It takes 40 days, and so Israel is in mourning during this embalming period. Uh, you can read about that in verses 1 through 4. And then in vi verses 5 through 11, 50th chapter 5 through 11, there's a public funeral. What's interesting about this public fu funeral in verses 5 through 11, that it actually involved three different nations. Of course, you have Israel. All of the children of Jacob are there. You have Israel. Um, and everybody went except the children. So apparently, uh, probably some wives stayed back with the children. But we know there, there were 70 in this family when they entered the, the land. I don't know how many they have now, but they had, they had 70 when they entered. Um, but there's Israel and there's Egypt and there's the Canaanites. Uh, they all are aware that a funeral is going on and they know who it is and they know all about it and they're all very curious about it. And when you read that, you will see these three nations, which kind of it's kind of interesting because, of course, it makes sense that you got Egypt, some nobility out of Egypt, and you got the Israelites, but the Canaanites, that's that's the people of the promised land, isn't it? I mean, that's that's the people of Israel one day. Uh, well, I say one day, 400 years from now, we'll go, march back in there, take them. But it's just kind of interesting that we have this is becoming an international funeral, which we're very much aware of today when a, a nobility dies. But listen, Jacob wasn't a nobility in, um, in any sense of the word. He was a patriarch to the Israelites, but he wasn't an international figure like, you know, like you might think of a dignitary of a nation. Yet all three nations are aware of it. And they're, they're, Two nations are aware of it because of Joseph. I, the real dignitary of this group is a guy called Joseph. Uh, and he is a key figure in all three nations uh, involved in the funeral of his father, Jacob. I mean, he is the key guy. Uh, you would have thought it would have been, Jacob would have been a key guy, but he wasn't. I mean, Joseph was. Now, in verses 10 and 11, as I read him to you earlier, I said that this word beyond the Jordan is an interesting word, probably is a reference, like most times, to the east of the Jordan on the border between Egypt and Canaan. And I gave you some passages. In fact, this becomes an issue in Matthew 4, right after Jesus comes out of uh, the, great, the, the great contest between he and Satan uh, in the wilderness, you know, on the mountain in, in verses uh, 1 through 11 or whatever it was uh, in there. Uh, this subject, uh, I'll show you something that's kind of interesting. If you want to go over there to Matthew just a moment. And this is about the subject beyond the Jordan. Uh, Matthew, the fourth chapter, is, is kind of interesting because in the New Testament when you read that, you don't pay any attention to it, but when you're reading it in the Old Testament and it gives a New Testament reference and it, it gives you interest. Um, uh, he's come out of that in verses 1 through 11 of chapter 4 of Matthew. Jesus come out of the warfare with the devil in the wilderness and he, and he begins his ministry. If you have a study Bible, it probably says Jesus begins his ministry. Something of that nature. Uh, and when he heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region, watch this, in the, in the region, meaning in the land designated to two sons of Jacob. See? See them listed there? Zebulun and Naphtali. See, and... The, so, listen, what you are, you're, now, when we study the New Testament, this is called the Galilean ministry. 
the, we call this the Galilean ministry. But you see in historical reference, they go back to these two tribal nations. They go back. Then look, there's a prophecy connected to that. Verse 14, this, this was to fulfill. That is the, gal listen, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you because if you don't know this background and you get into this, the, you pay attention to the, the big Galilean ministry. Jesus' great ministry was a Galilean ministry. You pay attention, you, you do that, and then you read stuff like this that don't click. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. And then I, I put this on your paper, um, Isaiah 9.1 right? And he talks about these two tribal lands, these two tribal lands, which now are called Galilee in the New Testament. By the way of the sea, watch this, beyond the Jordan. See, we're talking about the west side. So we're talking about the west side. We're talking about Galilee. We're not talking about the east side. See? Beyond the Jordan, beyond the Jordan, uh, the Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and to those who were sitting in the land and the shadow of death upon them, a light dawned. And that's a prophetic, uh, a prophetic word. Okay? So, so there again we have that concept of beyond the Jordan. They, they are apparently on the east side and beyond the Jordan is the west side and they were halted. The, the place, the threshing floor at, at uh, Etad apparently is on the east side. And, but the funeral, and they have a, they have a seven day deal and then they're going to go over and have a grave side service o over at the cemetery of the patriarchs well anyhow it's just it's just kind of interesting stuff now let me show you something else interesting <clears throat> wherever they are and most think they were on the east side uh, probably in edom somewhere um because of the seven day mourning the people of the land renamed the threshing floor They named it, we, we would say Abel, Abel. They named it Mizraim. Now, we know that Mizraim is the word for e Egypt. Notice the I am on the end of the word means it's plural. Therefore, Egyptians. But here's what's unique about it in the Hebrew. You probably, like most people, if you saw the word Abel, you would probably think that it has something to do with Cain and Abel. Not so. Not so. Not so at all. So I wrote the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word Abel that's used with Mitzrayim, right, is the word mourning. And see, it's, it's, it's got the X, B, L. See that? That's in the Hebrew means mourning. Now the word, the word that's used for Abel, Cain and Abel has an H on it. I wrote it. I wrote it on the paper for you. You see it? Yes. And that, that means breath. And you can go back when she gave birth to the child. Usually, these names are given by some experience that the people have, and they, they name it that way. <clears throat> and so, had, had apparently had something to do with his birth, with Abel's birth. So, it, it's just kind of some interesting things there, because in English, you can't tell that. Right? It says Abel, therefore you think, well, it must have been named after Cain and Abel. I wonder why. And the truth of the matter is, it wasn't. It's not the same, it's not the same in Hebrew. And therefore it means mourning. They mourn it, grieving. 
morning. Well, tonight I want to look at three things about death, descendants, and decisions. One, when a believer dies, there are three departures of the human being. It's important you know that. I'm going to, I'm going to, I wrote down 1 Thessalonians 5.23 from the New American Standard, and I'm going to use that order to show you their departure with the life of Christ when he died. Here's what it says. Here's what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now may the God of peace himself, that's a reference to the peace that comes through Jesus Christ in Romans 5, 1 and 2. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit, notice that's a little, a little s, that's a human spirit. May your spirit, your soul and your body be, be preserved complete without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that same order, the spirit, the soul and the body and show it with the death of Christ, okay? In Luke 23:43 in in Luke 23:46 Jesus quotes Psalms 31:5. And here's what he says. He says, "Father, now he's ready to die. He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He's going to bow his head and give up the spirit and die. Okay? That's recorded in Luke 23:40. He's quoting Psalms 31:5. Psalms 31.5 was huge to the Jew uh, uh, and it's going to be huge even in the book of Acts, the concept. It should be huge even into our day. Into, into your hands I commit my spirit. Uh, Stephen said it. If you recall when Stephen died, he said the same thing. It's a Hebraic idea of death. The true is, is still true for you and I. In John 19.30, Jesus said, according to John, John's account, John 19.30 at his death, Jesus said, it is finished and he gave up his spirit or ghost. He gave up his spirit. It is finished. Okay? It is finished. That, that's a very, a, a, that's a very famous, in the perfect tense, is given in the perfect tense, a very famous theological concept. John, John's writing theology of it, and uh, Luke is writing the medical part of it. He, he's looking at it from a whole different perspective. Yet they're both looking at it from a theological point of view. For Luke, he's really talking about the spirit leaving the body. John's looking at the theology of it. Luke, Luke is actually looking at what's actually going on from the creative side of man, the medical creative side of man, which makes that kind of interesting. Now, where does this whole concept come from out of the Hebrew Bible? Where does this concept come from? And don't miss it because it's very important to understanding the trichotomous of man. It comes from Genesis 2.7. This is where it comes from. This is true for all, all mankind. Here's where it comes from. God creates Adam's bottom body out of, out of the dirt, dirt, right? The dust of the earth business. And breathes, breathes into his nostrils the breath of lives, plural. Nishama Haim. Nishama Haim, C-H-A-Y-Y-I-M, Nishama, Nishama, the breath of lives and breathed into his nostrils, the breath of lives. 
And what you're going to have is trichotomous man. That is body, soul, and spirit. That's the trichotomous. That's the I am. Now, the Hebrews thought of this as one unit. Now, Hebrews, the second chapter, verse 7, God breathed into his nostrils. We got a body there. He breathes into his nostrils, and man becomes a living soul. And so they see the entirety. They see that the body is alive, the soul is alive, because he has a spirit. The Nisha Mahayim, the Hayim is life, the plurality of life. The breath of God brings the plurality of life, life to the body life to the soul, the human spirit. And when a person dies, these are separate. They're separated. Life, human life, is when they're all intact. Death, they are all separated again. And you, you see this. For example, what happens to the human spirit at death goes back to the Father goes back to the one who gave it, goes back. Whoever gave us Nisha Mahayim is where it goes back. goes back to the Father. It goes back to the Creator God. All right? The body, we're most familiar with that, the body goes to the grave. That's why it's called a funeral. That's the funeral. It's all about the body. And at the funeral, we talk about the soul. Where did it go? Well, it depends. If it's saved... In the Old Testament, if it was saved, he went to Abraham's bosom or paradise. And today, if you're saved, it goes to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, absent from the body, absent from the what? Body, absent from the body. What did Jesus die on the cross for? The soul. Does the unbeliever have a spirit? Yes. Yes, he does. Sure does. If, if, if he dies, I mean, he... You can't be alive without it. And the sign, you're dead, the sign that you're dead is gone. That's a sign that you're gone. You, you can't be alive and not have a spirit. It, it's, it's not Hebraic. You're never going to find it in the Bible anywhere. You'll find the word death, but you'll never find it connected to the spirit. Never. There are many that teach it. It's not a biblical concept that you're going to be able to, you're able, you're never going to be able to run it out theologically. Because when you get in the Old Testament, there is no way. I'll show it to you some today. There's no way you'll ever get it. It's all based on Genesis 2-7. All based on Genesis 2-7. There's a part of man that's dead. It's his relationship to God. The first death will wind up the second death if you don't get saved. The second death is to somebody who's already dead, physically dead. What are you going to do with that? <laughs> what are you going to do with that? But it's a, definitely it's a spiritual thing. It has to do with your relationship with God. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father except through me. What are you going to do with that? Well, anyhow, so the human spirit. Genesis 2-7 is what this whole thing is about. And I'll tell you something else. Nisha Mahayim is given to everything that has the breath of life in it. Everything on day five and six has Nisha Mahayim. We're talking about animals. What's the Everybody has high. When an animal dies, he's got the same deal. He's got, the, he's got the same deal. What makes the animal, on day five and six, what makes the difference between the animals that have a body, soul, and spirit, and they do, and man who has a body, soul, and spirit? What, what's the difference? How they're created. The animals are created according to their kind. Their DNA is completely done. We're, we're, we're done according to Salim de Muth. Right? They're done according to what's called in the Hebrew the word mim. 
M-I-N. Yes. And that tells you a great story about this whole thing. I mean, we're the only people. You don't, you don't, get, you don't go out and preach the gospel to animals, but you do to mankind. Why? Because we're made in the image according to the likeness of God. And listen, when Adam sinned, what died in us was our relationship with God. And the only way it can be restored is through Jesus Christ. The only way. The human soul, in Luke 23, 43, he tells the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. And he goes to Sheol, to the burial place after life. If, you're, if you were a believer, you went to paradise. If you were an unbeliever, you went to torment, right? The place called torment. And there they both wait the resurrection, right? They both wait the resurrection. Uh, the saved are going to be part of the first resurrection order, the order, and the unbeliever will, he'll go for the second, and, and that's the great white throne judgment bill business. But what's interesting, Jesus goes there. That's where you went. He goes there on a great, great mission, though, doesn't he? I mean, he goes there on a mission. He's going to be there three days. Uh, and when he comes out of that grave and ascends back to the Father and is seated at the right hand of God the Father, when you die, you go to heaven. You don't go to Sheol. You go to heaven. There, now, you have absent for the body, present with the Lord. And we don't even talk in terms of heaven. We talk in terms of being in the presence of the Lord. I mean, we know he's in the third heaven, therefore we call it that. But listen, that's not your permanent residence. You do know that. Your permanent residence, residence is, is Revelation 21, 22, the new heaven and new earth. That's where you're going to wind up. This, this, this is a temporary holdover. Just like Sheol was, this is a temporary holdover. <clears throat> to be absolutely we, we we wait the great resurrection. We call it the rapture for us. <clears throat> We're looking for the order of it to come. But even then, that's a when you die, you're absent from the body, and they call it sleep. The soul. It's all about Acts 1, 9 through 11 with Jesus Christ. He's up from the grave, but he's not back with the Father. So 40 days, and then Acts 1, 9 and 11, the 9 through 11, we have him at the end of these post-resurrection appearances going back to the Father. And there's this great declaration that he's leaving and going back to the Father, and he's coming again. I mean, that's an enormous passage. Uh, in Ephesians 1.20, he is raised and seated. Raised and seated. He is resurrected and raised and seated. We call that raising business. We call that the ascension, resurrection ascension, in order to go into session, seated at the right hand of God the Father. So, for the Christian today, 2 Corinthians 5, 6, 7, and 8 is very important. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And, and when we die, our body goes to the grave, our spirit returns to the Father, and our soul goes to be with the Lord, our Redeemer. In the Old Testament, and, and we believe we're gathered to our people. And we, by our people, we mean those that are redeemed. In the Old Testament, they believed the same thing. They were going to, there was, they were going to be, it says of Jacob, it says of Abraham, gathered to his people. Isaac, gathered, gathered to his people. Jacob, gathered to his people. They, they believe the same thing that we do. They, they would say, well, you, you know, you, you'll be with Abraham until the day of resurrection. 
right? That's Luke 16. <clears throat> now, I'll show you. Let's go to Ezekiel. Uh, not Ezekiel, but um, um, Ecclesiastes. I want to go to Ecclesiastes a moment. I want to show you. Uh, I want to show you a couple things just to give you an idea. Uh, Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter, he gets in a discussion uh, in verse 6 about dying and gives an illustration of the silver cord is broken, the golden bowl, bowl is crushed, the pitcher by the well is shattered, and the wheel at the center is crushed. Then, that's a description of dying grace. Then, uh, in Ecclesiastes' mind. Then the dust will return to the earth. I, 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 Ecclesiastes, I mean, Ecclesiastes 12, 7. I just read 6. Uh, now I'm in 7. Dust will return to earth. See that? The Spirit will return to God who gave it. Okay? The body the body returns, the spirit returns, right? Body returns to the dust, spirit returns to the Father. In Psalms 104, I, I, and listen, there's just tons of these. I'm just giving you a little bit. 104, 20, let's see, 29. Yeah, 29. Here's another one, just to give you an idea. <clears throat> Thou dost hide thy face, they are, dis they are dismayed. Thou dost take away their spirit, they expire. Nisha Mahayim comes in, you're alive. When it's withdrawn, you die. You're expired. Thou take away their spirit, and they expire, and return to their dust. Okay, <clears throat> and you'll find that those aren't just rare discussions. And I'll tell you something: what you what you don't pay any attention to in here. Do you know what he, you know what that whole what you know what this whole chapter one hundred and four is about? Animals. Animals. <laughs> Animals. Of course, most everybody's familiar with the human body. It, it dies. It dies because Nisha Mahayam was withdrawn. And when it's withdrawn, it, 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 th for the human experience of Nisha Mahayam is the spirit. And therefore, the spirit is withdrawn. Goes back to the father. The body is dead, and it depends on what the soul, whether it's redeemed or not, where it goes. And there's your deal. Uh, and the human body, of course, the burial of Christ, uh, you know, in the tomb of Joseph. In Job 34, 14, and 15, watch the ifs. If he should determine to do so, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath. See that connection? All flesh would perish together. It's exactly what happened in the flood. It's exactly what happened in the flood of Genesis 6, 17. That's exactly what happened to Abraham in, Ge in Genesis 25, 8. You know what it says? It says, he breathed his last. You know what that means? <laughs> it means God went, Pfft. that's what he did. Pfft. Tell you. If you're spiritually in tuned, you can see it happen. You can, you can actually see it happen. You can see it happen.
when a person dies. Most people don't want to. They're, they, they don't hang around. It's weirdos like me. Okay. Here's a second idea. Because of what just happens is the reason we have funerals. Jacob reminds us how how comforting it is for the bereaved family when the deceased has a legal will and prearranged funeral. I mean, one of the things you learn with studying spiritually mature believers in the Old Testament is that principle. Abraham did it, Isaac did it, Jacob did it, Joseph did it. I mean, people, listen to me. This is really important for your family you leave behind. It is comforting to be able to carry out the desires of the deceased as well as have it paid for in advance. Because how would you possibly know? You know, here's what people don't realize. About every 10 years, funeral, your funeral cost doubles. You know why? Because it involves real estate and caskets, which are like automobiles. All that stuff, price goes up on them. The sensible thing is to prearrange it. It's the smart because you're gonna listen. You're gonna you're gonna get it back in ten years. You're gonna break even in ten years, and you go beyond that, you're making money. Now I know it's a hard way to think about it, but it is business. Oh, it's business when you go down to the funeral home. It's business, right? <laughs> it's business. And how do you know? Now, you, your, your father, father or mother or somebody like that or brother or something might have said, listen, don't spend a lot of money on you. But then you got the pressures of all kinds of people in your family that, well, let's not go cheap and let's not do this and let's do that. And, and you got all this gobbledygook. Listen, better to have it prearranged. You just, it's so much easier for the family to take all that away. Listen. He wanted to be in a pine board box. Let's put him in a pine board box. They got one. They, won't, they don't offer it to you, and they don't show it to you, but they got one. <laughs> now, they got a Fiat somewhere. You don't have to have a Rolls Royce. They got a Fiat somewhere in that line up down there. <clears throat> Jacob made a will for the living regarding their lives. That should be not lies. <laughs> That's probably more true than <laughs> Jacob made a will for the living regarding their lives <clears throat> in Genesis uh, 49. And, and listen, if you have a legal will, and you should have one, listen, if you're going to write your own, be sure you have it um, notarized. Be sure to do that. In the state of Alabama, you do that, but just because you got a piece of toilet paper, you still got to have somebody with credentials to <laughs> The legal will should be examined about every 10 years to update it. I mean, you've, I mean after 10 years, you forgot what you even wrote in it. And uh, things change all the time. I mean, about every 10 years, your life is in a, so you go back in there and you look at it. I mean, kids are all raised. They're all right. And so you change all that. You change your executors probably. I mean, we do. Um, I guess I do this stuff probably a little more than most people because I deal with it so much. Um, there should be a living will. Let me tell you, you're, you're somebody that you're responsible goes to goes to the hospital without a living will. Boy, you could be in mucho trouble financially. They won't release them. And boy, you better have a living will. If there's nothing, get them to the hospital. You can go to the hospital and, and get one. You need to have a living will. Boy, we went this with John Dyer on his mother or father. Wow, was that a mess. Wow, was that a mess. You, you get into, into medical treatment, you could be in a heap of trouble without it. Uh, 
uh, in financial obligations, there should be a memorial will. There should be a memorial will concerning personal belongings and estate things. There ought to be a memorial will. But I'm, I tell you, you, you have no idea what people will fight over. I mean, some of the most unbelievable things. And so I tell everybody, we call it a memorial will. And I tell them to go room by room through your house and whatever you think your people want, put it, put it in there and again, have somebody, uh, your executor and one other person sign off on that memorial will. You don't have to have it in a noted, noted Republic type thing, but have the executor and one other person in the family signed off that, yeah, this was what they wished. And, and listen, and then, therefore, when somebody dies, everybody goes in, here, here's what mother or dad wanted you to have, here it is, here it is, and what's left? You call somebody in, come in, take it away, and give it to who you want to give it, right? And then you pick out some, and listen, I tell people, if you have a special place, if there's a special um, donational place, a special one that you would want clothes and things to go to, put it in there. Because you may have, otherwise they just have, they just call somebody on the spur of the moment and say, come out here and pick this stuff up, right? I mean, but this person may say, well, I wanted to go to Hannah home or I want to go to some special, you, you ought to note that. These are all, you know what this does? It takes all that pressure off from people that don't know what to do with all that. And it takes forever to get rid of this stuff. And for, for some people, it's just stuff, and for other people, you know, if mom or dad or whatever thought that, that, that you would want that and, and you had somehow they had a conversation with him. Uh, I tell this story all the time about my son, Billy. I did this with mother. She says, well, I got nothing. Of course you got stuff. It filled up four rooms. What are you going to do with this? Well, she started going through stuff. Took her a couple of weeks to go through special stuff, the jewelry and stuff. You know, I want this to go to Rhonda. I want to go this. And so um, when Billy would go over and spend time with her when he was a young little boy, my mother loved to listen to music. She had this wonderful big uh, console um, stereo that played 78s and 45s and put that little 45 thing down over to all that stuff. Seven, and uh, uh, Kenny, what'd you call those those Bach things that you stuck in and played? A tracks, a tracks. <laughs> but see, she had all that, and so she wanted Billy to have it because when he was a little guy, she would keep him. She he'd go over there and they dance and do stuff like that. See, so she knew for sure. Well, you know, I love. <laughs> You know, Billy's married, got kids, and he's in a whole other world. I take that over there. And he goes, Dad, what am I going to do with that? I said, I don't know. Grandma wanted you to have it. Well, now that's been 100 years ago. One day I was over at his house going through the <clears throat> garage. I noticed in the corner he had something, a blanket over something. And I said, what's over there in the corner? He said, I will go over and take a look. I went over there. There it was, Mother's. <clears throat> and I said, does it work? And he said, yeah, every once in a while I just feel guilty. I come down, I run it and play a record when I'm cleaning the car or something. And I said, well, why don't you just get rid of it? Somebody would like that. He said, I can't. He said, Dad, you'd have no many. There's, I've tried to get rid of that so many times. I can't just. And so we just, everybody knows in the family, they, we keep it covered. And during the summers, we bring it out when we clean cars and do stuff, and we play old stuff. And remember Grandma, and it said it's been quite a unique thing. But, but listen, that's what. Listen, it's a, then it's okay, Billy. I said it's okay, Billy. If you need permission, I give you permission. You can get rid of it. He said, Dad, I don't need permission. I just can't do it. <laughs> I just can't. And I know that feeling. Uh, it took me a year to get rid of the stuff she left to me. It wasn't worth nothing. Um, Joseph, Joseph, he, Jacob made Joseph the executor of his will in Genesis 50. And the executor, if you're part of that person, uh, ever have that privilege, 
executor needs to know about important papers, insurance, VA information, deeds, social security, birth certificate, checking, savings, investments, indebtedness, loans. Make it easy on them. Set a place aside in your home where all those special papers are kept. Uh, we have a cedar chest. It's been passed down through the family, and every, every, every family member has it, and it's passed to the executor, <laughs> this big old family chest. Uh, so I have it right now. Uh, I've, I've, in fact, it got to my house, and I wound up executor of about three or four different people, so that stayed with me a long time. Uh, also, listen, you need, to, you need to make a list of people to contact at the time of death and funeral. You need to make that list. People don't know, and there are people that would go, I wish I'd have known. So you need to make that list. You need to know what newspapers in and out of state. Uh, you need to know things about, about the person, especially if you're an executor, their family, some family history, occupation, college, civil organizations, church, personal history, to put newspapers. Especially if you're the executor. You got to know all this stuff. Joseph, as the executor, says in Genesis 50, verse 5, my father, and he's talking to Pharaoh as the executor of the will of Jacob. He says to Pharaoh, uh, to Egyptian authority, my father made me swear, that's an oath, behold, I'm about to die in my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. See, prearranged. There you shall bury me. Now, therefore, please let me go up and bury my father, then I will return. Isn't that interesting? I mean, listen, listen. if you're an executor, your work just begins after, after they die. Probating of the will and, and listen, you get birth certificates. You, listen, you might as well get a dozen. Right? I mean... Every Tom, Dick, and Harry's got to have one of them. I, what did I say? Uh, a death, a death certificate. I'm at a death certificate. Uh, yeah. I mean, I know people will go like, well, I'll probably, I'll, I probably only need three. And I say, listen, start with a dozen. I mean, every, everybody's got to have one. You, you, and, and, and you probably need more than that, but I wouldn't do less of that. And here And here is the, f listen, for most families, the funeral is the third largest uh, uh, purchase they'll make in their life. Third largest. It's a chunk of change. It sure is today. It's a chunk of change. Um. Six reasons, people, six reasons for believers, the death of a believer. Let me tell you six. There's probably more, but here's six. One, the believer's work in the Christian way of life is completed. Jesus said it when he said it's finished. That's about as clear as it gets, isn't it? It's finished. Uh, Paul said it in 2 Timothy 4, uh, Six, seven, and eight. Paul said it. He didn't say it. He was a little more wordy, like a lot of us. A little more wordy, but he said the same thing. You know, finish the course. You know, run the race. Finish the course. Do the, you know? Um, Paul in Philippians one twenty one through twenty three. He, he talks about this. He says he talks about the time of his departure, and he talks about. To live is Christ and to die is gain. And I thought about that a lot. They have some scriptures grab you. I would have thought the opposite. If somebody, if that had been a gate question, I'd have done homework before I could have got in. Uh, Ecclesiastes, third chapter, verse 2, talks about the timing of departure is, is, is God's business. 
timing. The second is dying grace glorifies God to the world. Dying grace glorifies God to the world. One of the passages I really like personally is Psalms 116, 15. Precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. That's one of my, that's one of my favorites. But I can tell you where this comes out is in Samson. Samson. Show you this dying grace that glorifies God to the world is Samson. When you read the story, when you read the death of Sam, Samson in Judges 16, 28 through 30, you know, they've, they've, they've took him captured. They've just treated him miserable, gorged out his eyes and all that business. And they're having this great festival to their gods. And they're going to bring him out, make a big sport out of him. And he has this prayer. This prayer is well worth your reading, too. He has this prayer. And he, he asks God, he said, he says to God, Strengthen me one more time and let me die in victory. I don't deserve it. It's not about earning it. Hey, he brought the house down. He said, let me die with the Philistines. And it says in his obituary that God writes, it says, Samson killed more enemies in death than in life. And Samuel, in his death, got into the Hall of Fame of Hebrews 11.32. He didn't get there by his life. He got there by his death. That's pretty amazing to me. A third is a special mode of believer's death that impacts others in Christ. A martyr's death, the, like Stephen, the martyr Stephen. In Acts 7. And the one that impacts me is Uriah. That's Bathsheba's husband that David as commander-in-chief dealt with so badly. But when you read, and I wrote down some key verses, like in 2 Samuel 11, 19, 26 through 27, the 23rd chapter 8 and 39, God honored this guy. And in the end, David did. He gave him the valor Medal of Honor. And listen to me. He's the last one written into the Valor Medal of Honor winners under David. When you read it, he is the last recorded. The fourth, and look, well, anyhow, you can... There's a lot to do with Uriah. The natural cause, where a person dies of what the medical field would probably cause a natural cause. Abraham, all the patriarchs died that way. <clears throat> uh, it says they breathe their last. All, pray, all patriarchs died of what we would call a natural uh, death. People would say, well, they died in their sleep or they were sitting in a chair and just died. Um, recently, uh, Dave, Dave Wiginat's mother died, and um, th they could find no cause, you know, medically. They said, well, we ought to check it because, and uh, she had a good friend. Um, they were going to go someplace, and uh, she couldn't get a hold of her, couldn't get a hold of her, and so she thought, well, she's something... And, then she got late that night. She's still going to get a hold of her, and she went, something's wrong. So she called the police to go down there and check. And, of course, uh, Dave, Dave was down here with us at that time, and his brother was out of town on business. So the police forced their way in and, and found her, uh, and they, they, quote, classified it 
uh, natural causes. They couldn't find, there was, you know, she just died a, a natural, breathed her last and died. Uh, <clears throat> it bothers a lot of people. On the one hand, they're glad, but then on the other hand, they worry, right, about, uh, I wonder how it was for her. Her neighbor felt bad, Dave felt bad, his brother felt bad, you know, until you go like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> You know, wait a minute. So, I mean, all the patriarchs died that way. And a lot of people in the Bible did. Uh, rapture without physical death. I mean, how do we even understand that? How, how is that? The rapture of the living church age believers. I mean, how are you changed from mortal to immortal without dying? I mean, that's just, anything else we've talked about tonight, it appeals to that discussion. Or in 1 Thessalonians 4.15, he talks about the dead in Christ and the living in Christ will be united in the air as one with him. I mean, how is that, how is that possible? I mean, that's just, and what kind of, what kind of big cloud would that be? Would that be something? I mean, what kind of cloud? Look up there and you go like, well, that looks like a whole bunch of people. Now I couldn't be. What is that? It's UFOs. That's what that is. Thank you, Horton. Uh, and finally, a believer could die under divine discipline. It's called the sin unto death. It, we've talked about Saul. One of the things that bothered me about Saul <clears throat> is, is suicide on a battlefield. I mean, that's about as bad as it gets. I mean, Samson had the right idea. I'm going to go down with my boots on. Saul didn't. Fell on his own sword on the battlefield. <clears throat> when he called up Samuel with the witch of Endor, Samuel told him, you're not going to like what I got to tell you. The Lord has turned away from you and become your enemy. Tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. Whoa. Tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. Now, on the one hand, maybe that's a good idea, isn't it? Because they're going to be with Samuel. That's got to be a good idea, right? But on the other hand, you, I mean, did he not have a wake-up call? And knowing that, he still took his life. You understand? He was told that way out front. He was told that way out. In chapter 28, he was told that. In chapter 31, he takes his life. He was told that tomorrow you will be with me. And it's the same thing that Jesus told the thief on the cross. And yet he chose suicide. That's crazy. People, that's crazy. Uh, and by the way, King Saul didn't make Hebrews 11. Made paradise, made it to Sheol, paradise, but he didn't make it. He was loving. Well, let's close in a word of prayer, and then we'll have our time of prayer. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these that have come our way to study with us. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our souls. You know, what we seek is truth. Always open to truth. Why? Because it said the truth will set us free. Free from what? Well, from the ability not to pick and choose our scriptures, but to be able to take them all and be able to see the same truth, the line of truth throughout of it all. So we pray for that. We're all seekers of the truth. I love what the guys told Jesus when he opened the scriptures on the road to Emmaus and began to teach him. They said, 
And he began to open them up and explain. It says, their hearts burned within them for the truth. Our hearts should burn for the truth. We should get excited. Because what we want is the truth, because the truth sets us free from the cosmic system. I pray we would be good students of the word. Always open to the truth. That we would be father people who are, when called upon to be executors of a will, would take it with privilege and take it with responsibility. And we're trying to give people a heads up because many in this room, if they haven't already been executors, will be because they're honorable people. And people know that the person they want as executors are honorable people. They will carry out their wishes. And so we've tried to give them a heads up on it. Just as Jacob did with Joseph. And Joseph will do that later. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life.